Why salvation so important? Is salvation important to you? Are you willing to be saved? Father, we thank Thee for the opportunity to studying of Thy Word, and we thank Thee for the great doctrines of Holy Scripture. And we pray that as we took into them throughout our course of uh, studies that we may come to understand Thee better as we understand the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Enables us, Lord, to approach thy word, willing to be taught and willing to have the Holy Spirit illuminate our minds and guide us into all truth. Enable us to put aside the things that hinder and prevent his teaching ministry in our lives, specifically our sin, and enable us to grow in grace and on the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We commit each one present to thee and pray thy blessing upon them and as we study we each are formed by the Spirit into a closer likeness to our Lord who has loved us and has given himself for us. And so at the beginning of our series of studies we commit ourselves to thee for thy blessing upon us. With a proper attitude and ask that as we do, and I hope you will pray in your own life as we do, we be willing to come under the direction of the Spirit's teaching. We begin with salvation, what it is and why it is so important, which I want to deal with it now. Now I'd like to say just a few words by way of introduction to our subject. Salvation, what it is and why it is so important. And I think as a basis for <coughs> our study, I want to turn to two passages in the Bible. First of all, one in the Old Testament and one in the New. And the first passage, just one verse, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. Now writing against the background of the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt and knowing that the deliverance which Israel experienced from Egypt was an example of the deliverance that you and I experience from sin. Moses writes in verse 23 in Deuteronomy chapter 6, And he brought us from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. I want you to notice the two expressions he brought us out from thence, that is from Egypt, that he might bring us in, so that the work of the salvation of Israel from the land of Egypt, that he might bring us in, so that the work of the salvation of Israel from the land of Egypt was a twofold work. It was a deliverance from Egypt. It is also a setting of the children of Israel in the land. So as Moses put it, he brought us out that he might bring us in. And in the work of salvation, there's, there is this twofold aspect. We are brought out from the dominion of sin, that we might be brought into Jesus Christ and experience all of the blessings that pertain to our position in Him. Now let's uh, turn to a passage in the New Testament, the small epistle to Titus, 
chapter 2 and we're going to begin reading with the 11th verse. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and the apostle Paul writes in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now notice that Paul put this in the past time the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. For Paul, the grace that brought salvation was a past event. But then he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. In this present world, that salvation has a present significance. And finally, he says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the apostle lived in the light, in the light of a past deliverance, looking for a future deliverance. So we might have here three times or three tenses in salvation, past, recent, and future. Now, salvation, what it is and why it is so important. And at the beginning of the, of the study, I want to impress upon you that I have three aims. First, to interest you in the truth as it pertains to soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. Second, to interest, to instruct you in the truth. And finally, to inspire you by the truth. And I do not think uh, that it is possible for us to properly teach the Bible unless we not only interest and instruct, but also inspire. So I hope through our studies or these reflections that you will be inspired and as you think on the great things that, con that concern our salvation. But when you study soteriology or theology, you must deal with some technical things and so I want to say a few words first of all about this term soteriology. So if you are taking note, this is Roman one, the term soteriology. And let's think first of all about the Old Testament background of this term. Soteriology, let me say, is a word derived from the Greek word for salvation. Soteriology means really the, the doctrine of salvation. There is a Greek word which is soteria. The Greek used that word to express salvation. As you can see, soteriology is a translation of this word plus the word logos, which means a word or sometimes a utterance or sometimes teaching. And so this is really the teaching of salvation. Soteriology, the teaching of salvation. Now, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, translated saved, the root from which we get the word salvation from the Old Testament is the word yeshua. Yeshua. The word in the Old Testament means to save. Now this word originally meant to make wide or to make spacious, but it came to mean to cause to be wise or to cause to be spacious. And thus, it, uh, it, it came by a process of change to mean to deliver. So the word soteriology or the word save in the Old Testament had the idea of deliverance that we used in the in, in two twofold sense of deliverance, deliverance from physical perils. For example, in, if in the Old Testament, Moses describes the children of Israel's deliverance out of Egypt. He may use the word save. 
Now, he doesn't mean by that that they were saved spiritually. He means they were saved physically. And so the word can be used in that sense. Is used in, this, in that sense in the Old Testament. It, it, it is also used in the spiritual sense. That is a salvation from sin. So salvation in the Old Testament was salvation physically depending on the context. Then salvation spiritually or deliverance from sin. In the New Testament, uh, the word for salvation is the word so-so. Now, this is an attempt to try to transliterate the Greek word. This is really more equivalent to our Z because it is Sira. But, but put this in your note and if you are around a real good Greek scholar, don't show, don't show him that. I am doing this for your sake. This is the word. If you want to show him the Greek word to show off your knowledge of uh, Greek, that's fine. But it is the word sozo in the New Testament. Translate, and that word is usually translated save in the New Testament. It is also used in the spiritual sense, that is salvation from sin. So salvation in the Old Testament was salvation physically. Depending on the context that then salvation is spiritually or deliverance from sin. In the New Testament, the word of salvation is the word sozo. Now, this is an attempt to try to translate the Greek word. This is really more equivalent to our Z because it is Sida. But uh, this is in your note and if you are around, a real good Greek scholar, don't show him that. I am doing this for your sake. This is the word. If you want to show him in the Greek word to show off your knowledge of Greek, Greek that's fine. But it's the word sozo in the New Testament. Translate and that word is usually a translated save in the New Testament. Now, this word too is a word that not only is used with reference to salvation from sin, but is also used of salvation from physical perils. And as a matter of fact, at the time of the apostles and the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, Soteria or soteria or soteria, the word salvation was a word that, that, that was frequently used for body, bodily health. If I should have met you in the street in the first century, I might have said to you, how is your sol, sol, solteria? That is, how is your health? So soteria is a word that meant health or salvation. Now, just like the Hebrew word yasha, it has several uh, senses. It may be used of deliverance in the physical sense from external evils and troubles. We could say that he is saved with reference merely to the physical. The context of the New Testament of the course where well, let us know what is, what is in view. Now the New Testament used the term in that sense and if we had time we could turn into someone passage. For example, in Acts chapter 27, the apostle uses the term to express deliverance from the storm that arose on the Mediterranean as he and his friends were making their way to Rome. But it is primarily used in the Bible in a spiritual sense. Just as the Old Testament it is a word that refers to our salvation, especially from the dominion of sin. And probably the first use of, of it in the New Testament is, is uh, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, which, in which, in a sense, we have a combination of both the Old Testament words for salvation and the New Testament word for salvation. Because remember in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, the angel said to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And Jesus is simply the Greek term for Joshua, which in turn is a word derived from Rosh Yeshua. The, the Hebrew word Yahushua, Joshua, which, Joshua means, which means the salvation that the Lord 
is salvation or the Lord is my salvation or something like that. Thou, thou shalt call his name Joshua. That is salvation, Jehovah's salvation or for he shall save sorrow. The Greek word save his people from their sins. So there is uh, now the saving work that Jesus does for us has three senses. It may be past, present, or future. And remember that we have said something about that when we read the, the Titus passage, past, present, and future. There are three tenses of salvation, past, present, and future. Now I think that Bob Ter Ter Tem calls this phase, phase one, phase two, and phase three of God's saving work. And I guess that's all right, proving we understand his terminology about the past, present, and future salvation. Salvation may be spoken as, a, as in, of, of, of in the past. It is then salvation usually from the guilt or penalty of sin. For example, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace that you have been saved through faith, past, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now that is past salvation. When, when, I, when a man believes in Jesus Christ, the moment he believes in Jesus Christ, salvation, uh, the moment he believes in Jesus Christ, he is delivered from the penalty of sin. Paul says it twice in that one passage in Hebrews 2, For by grace that you have been saved. He means that salvation not from some physical ill. He means salvation from spiritual ills. But he uses the past tense deliverance from the penalty of sin. He shall never, as we should, uh, as we shall see, come under judgment again. For Jesus Christ has worn that judgment. So, also may speak of salvation and prevent time. Now, I think it might do well for us to look at a passage in present time because this is not too familiar to us. Let's uh, take two, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, now that this passage is capable of two interpretations, but it won't affect what I'm saying because what I'm telling is taught the Holy Spirit, is, is taught that of the New Testament without question. Verse 15 we, we read, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Jesus Christ, in them that are being saved literally, and in them that are perishing. Or turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, and I think this this text is really a better one than the other one. And I should have given it to you first to start with. Here the Apostle states, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness, but unto us which are being saved. Again, the word which is, which is translated here are saved is in the Greek text as present principle are being saved. It is the power of God so we can speak of ourselves as having been saved. We can also speak of ourselves as being saved. Now that we do mean when we say that we are being saved, how is it possible for us to say I have been saved and yet I am being saved? Well, only of course if we are speaking of different types of judgment, for example, or different types of, of deliverance I cannot say I have been saved from the penalty of sin and I am being saved from the penalty of sin that would be contradictory the Bible re never contradicts itself truth does not contradict itself but I may say I have been saved from the penalty of sin and I am being saved from the power of sin in my daily life 
And that, of course, is what Paul means. He means we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We shall never come under judgment for our sin, but nevertheless, we are not completely delivered from the power of sin. Wives, look at your husband who has been saved from the penalty of sin, but has been saved from the power of sin completely. Now, you probably had some fresh evidence of that body. I assure you that may read it. So you may well have the experience of having been saved. But the salvation from the power of sin here have, is something that will continue as long as we are in the flesh. For we will possess the Old Testament. For we will possess the old nature. Now, what possibly could mean when we say that we shall be saved? Well, again, if we are talking about the same thing, we have hopeless confusion. But if we are talking about something different, then it makes sense. I think we ought to look at a passage too. Let's look at Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. Now here's Paul states in verse 11 of Romans chapter 13, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. It sounds as if Paul doesn't really have the salvation yet. And yet he's the same person who said, for by grace have you been saved. And he's the one who says that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But he also says, our salvation is nearer than when we believe. And of course, he could not possibly say that if he meant salvation from the penalty of sin. So, he must uh, means something else and of course he does as we know from his other teaching. He has referenced of course to salvation from the presence of sin. When we have been saved we still have our old nature and so sin is present in us even though we are delivered from the penalty of sin. We are progressively, by being delivered from the power of sin, by the work of the Holy Spirit within us, through the Word of God. That's why you are here tonight. You are here today. You are here listening through Facebook and YouTube. I hope after listening, you leave more delivered from the power of sin. But there is a time coming when Jesus Christ shall come and the saints should go up to meet him in the air. And all of us who have old natures will have those old natures eradicated, eliminated, destroyed, but not until then. Then we shall be delivered from the presence of sin. So you see, it's possible to speak of salvation in three tenses, past, present, and future. I, and I usually teach them right at the first part of... Uh, The teaching about salvation, when where Paul states that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
It concerns Bishop Westcott, who is in an evangelical Anglican bishop in England. And uh, Westcott was a man who was a genuine Christian who loved the Lord and loved the things of the Lord. And one day, he was walking on the streets of one of the cities in England and he saw an old-fashioned Salvation Army meeting in which the workers together sang hymns. And then one of them gave a testimony or preached from the Word. And at the conclusion of the meeting, having gathered a crowd by the singing and by the preaching, the workers would move out among the audience and seek to make contact to lead some to the Lord. And so a little lassie saw the bishop standing over with his bishop's attire on and thought, Ah, there's a good feast for me to land, bishop. And so when the meeting was over, she went up to Bishop Westcott and she said, Sir, now Westcott was one of the greatest of the Greek scholars. She said, Sir, are you saved? And he said, Young lady, what do you mean? Do you mean Isotain, Jesus my, she's uh, so so may, or so te so my? And of course, she was utterly dumbfounded by what he said. And then he went on with a smile to point out to her that the doctrine of salvation had three tenses. And that if she meant, had he been saved or has he been saved, Isotain or Sizumai, yes, he had been saved from the penalty of sin. If she meant Sosomai, well, he could not really say that he was completely saved. That process was going on. And if she meant Sotizumai, future, well, then he was not saved at all yet because his salvation was still off. It was nearer than when he believed and it was coming, but it was not there yet. So now turn to uh, so now to sum up what I've been trying to say. The term soteriology then refers to deliverance. Basically, it is a deliverance that may be physical or spiritual. But when we talk about the doctrine of salvation, theologically, we are primarily talking about the spiritual deliverance. For that is the important thing, spiritual deliverance. And not only is that deliverance a deliverance from something, but it also a deliverance unto something. So we are taken out of the old life and we are placed in the new life, as Moses said concerning the children of Israel. God has brought you out that he might bring you in. And it isn't enough, by the way, for us to know that we have been saved from the penalty of sin. He wants us to go on and discover all of the things that we have in Christ, what we have now and what we shall have. And then that salvation has three tenses, that spiritual salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future, one from the penalty of sin, the other two from the power and presence of sin. Now, Romans chapter 2 the relation of soteriology to systematic theology. And let me just say very simply that what I meant by this heading is soteriology is the natural outcome of the work of Jesus Christ. Now, we have studied, and I, and I have studied several years over here, we have studied uh, bibliology or the study of the doctrine of the Bible. We said something about its inspiration, remember, and the revelation that God has given us. And we said something about illumination, how we understand the Bible through the Spirit's work. We also studied theology proper. We studied the Trinity, for example, the decrees of God, the providence of God, and other matters along that line. And then, we studied an angelology and anthropology. We studied the doctrine of Satan, and we studied the doctrine of man. 
they were related and we tried to relate them and we showed how Satan uh, we showed how uh, Satan was created how Satan feel how true Satan man having been created feel and we then finished with the history of the activities of Satan according to the Bible now the next subject in theology would normally be a discussion of the work of Jesus Christ and that is Christology or the doctrine of Christ and then once having discussed what Christ is and has done then we should discuss the application of that to those who believe or soteriology so we are going to study Christology and soteriology the doctrine of Christ who he is and what he has done and its application to men which is soteriology so we are going to study then the application of the person and work of Christ to those who believe in him now that is all I want to say right there the relation of soteriology to systematic theology it is of course right at the center of systematic theology and then I guess I should say once having studied this when then we should study the doctrine of the church and finally we should go on to discuss the doctrine of eschatology because that is the doctrine of future of future things central to what we have been studying so far is this soteriology now Romans 3 the scope of soteriology the scope of soteriology and I, I just want to say this about it Soteriology is the application. I'd like for you to get that word down in your mind and on your and on your uh, paper if you have and in your papers and in your mind or in your mind. It is the application of the work of Christ, the person and the work of Christ to believers. That is it's that is its scope. We are dealing with the application of what God has done through Christ to believers. Now Romans 4, the importance of soteriology. I'll spend a little more time on this. I would like to suggest to you three reasons why soteriology is important. Christology and soteriology. First of all, it is important in the, in the salvation of souls from the standpoint of the recipient of the message of salvation. I know something about soteriology. If God has a plan for the salvation of men, it is plainly of the greatest importance that men understand it. If you turn to the Bible, you will discover that not only are men interested in the doctrine of salvation, but even the angels are interested in it. Prophets are interested in it. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 and uh, let's read a passage that we read once I think at least once 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 Peter is speaking about the salvation that we have in Christ and he says of which salvation uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 of which salvation that pro the prophets have inquired and searched diligently now you can see the prophets were very much interested in the, in the salvation that God has given us in Jesus Christ who prophesied uh, of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it, it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And to whom it was revealed that is the prophets that not unto themselves but unto us they, they, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven what things the angels desired to look into so the prophets and the angels are interested in the salvation that God provides I think it is of the greatest importance that we understand Salvation, for it is in a sense a study of what God has given us when we believe in Christ. Secondly, it is important in the, in the evangelization, evangelization of others or sinners, if you like, from the standpoint of the preacher 
and every one of us is a preacher from the standpoint of the preacher of the message of salvation, soteriology is of the greatest significance. It's linked with the gospel. It is the gospel. And the New Testament, of course, as you know, constantly over and over affirms that salvation is by the gospel or that through the gospel salvation comes to men. And so that if we are going to bring men to Christ, we must understand soteriology or salvation. It is tremendously important that we bring the right message to people when we do preach the word. I am not speaking about a man speaking who stands in the pulpit. It is obvious that he must preach the right message, but it is of the greatest significance that you as a Christian offer to others the gospel in its purity. Therefore, it is necessary that you understand something about soteriology. Many evangelists today are giving a message that, it, that is not clear when they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For example, you will frequently find men faithfully preach the person and work of Jesus Christ and then say, in order to be saved, what you must do is believe and surrender to Jesus Christ. Now, when you study the New Testament, you will discover that surrender is not the proper term a response to the gospel. As a matter of fact, when you read the New Testament, you discover that no one can surrender until he has been saved. If a man could surrender to God, he would not need the salvation. And when Paul will use a term that is synonymous with surrender, he, he addresses it to Christians. And I said yesterday, and I said in preaching, Paul said, I beseech in Romans chapter 12, I, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. So the term surrender is addressed to Christians, not to non-Christians. The New Testament term of salvation, as we shall see, is believe. You may want to explain believe in different ways, but be careful that you do not use a term that is contrary to its essence. You might say and properly trust or rely upon or receive, but believe is the term that the New Testament uses far more than any other term. Believe. It does not say believe and surrender. It says believe. Therefore, it is of the greatest significance that we understand what salvation uh, really as if we are going to preach our gospel purely. The Bible never says, for example, believe in Jesus Christ and come down front to the altar. A man does not get saved by coming down to the front to an, to an altar. He is saved when he believes in Jesus Christ. Now, finally, Romans 5, the divine motivation in soteriology. And I would like, uh, and I would like, but I would uh, just like to mention very quickly with just a remark or two or several reasons which the Bible gives us for God's saving work. First of all, to manifest His glory in His love for men. To manifest His glory in His love for men. God not only had as one of his motivations our salvation, but he also had as one of his motivations that he should be that he should be glorified in his love for us. Now I would like to, for you to put down as a passage, First John chapter four, uh, verses seven through fourteen, and I want you to read that passage if you will and study it. And you will discover that one of, of the reasons that God has given us this great salvation is to manifest His glory in the salvation of men. Secondly, another motive that God had, had in providing salvation for men is to bestow upon us eternal life. I think this is probably a lesser motive than to glorify himself. But it is expressed in a passage like John 3, 16. For God to love the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, one of the motives of God in saving is the gift of eternal life. Now, 
This is of course a man motive. The glory of God is the divine motive. Thirdly, God has saved us that we might do great, do good works. That is expressed as one of His motives. It was expressed in that Titus passage that we read, remember? Posted in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people jealous of good works. And remember, in Ephesians chapter 2 we read, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Fourth, God has saved us in order that we might offer spiritual sacrifices unto God. Now, that is expressed for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He states that one of the reasons God has brought us unto Himself is that we shall offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, those sacrifices are the sacrifices of praise. You know, a Christian who never praises God has not fulfilled the purpose of his salvation. One of our sacrifices is our giving. And we have never really fulfilled the end of our salvation until we have given. And those praise in our money and of course, the greatest sacrifice of all is the sacrifice of ourselves to give ourselves to Him for His use. Fifthly, He has saved us to the end that we might live with Him. Now, that is expressed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 10. In other words, God saved us not just to deliver from hell, not just that we should do good works, not in order and not in order that His glory may be seen in our salvation only, but He wants to enjoy our presence. And He wants us to enjoy His throughout all eternity. You know what God has done in our hearts? It's just the beginning. Just the beginning. And then sixthly, to the end that we might show forth His excellences. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, that ye should show forth his excellence of the one who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, someone has rendered that, and I think correctly, advertise. A question is to be a working advertisement of that salvation that has come to him. There ought to be a truth in lending law, a truth in advertising law by Christians too. You know, we have truth, we have truth in advertising, truth in lending, but we don't have any truth in Christianity. So there are lots of people who could go around and say, I am a Christian, but you'd never know if it, you never know it if they had not said it. But nevertheless, one of the purposes is that we should show forth the excellences, advertise the virtues of our God. I repeat, but nevertheless, one of the purposes is that we should show forth the excellences. You know, someone has rendered that, that and I think, correctly advertise. A Christian is to be a walking advertisement of the salvation that has come to him. There ought to be a truth in lending law, a truth in advertising law by Christians too, you know, we have truth in advertising, truth in lending, but we don't have any truth in Christianity. 
So there are lots of people who could go around and say, I'm a Christian, but you'd never know, know it if they had not said it. But nevertheless, one of the purposes is that we should show forth the excellences, advertise the virtues of our God. And finally, we have been saved in order that God may through us show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness to us throughout eternity. That's expressed in Ephesians chapter 2 and, and verse 7. And I'm going to, to close by reading this particular verse saying, just saying one word about it. Paul says that he has raised up that he has raised us up together, made us to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So we have been saved not only to glorify God now, but that all throughout the ages of eternity, the whole of God's creation may see exhibited in us the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us. You know, I think heaven is going to be one great meeting for a long time until we all get acquainted. And we're going to hear the testimony of the work of God in the life of every single believer down through the centuries before the time of Christ and after. Isn't that going to be interesting? Wouldn't you like to hear Isaiah get up and give his testimony? I think I could listen to him for 30 minutes or so. And all of eternity is going to be the expression of the glory of God in the revelation of His kindness toward us. Not only in the past, but I think all down to the years of time. So God has a tremendous motivation in our salvation. And I am so thankful that I am one of the saved. A missing grace how sweet the sound that save a rich like me and the heaven is going to be great in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen ang kaligtasan na binigay ng Diyos sa ating buhay binigay sa mga lahat ng totoo at tunay na kristyano ay talagang totoo at hindi na ito ba bawiin o kukunin ng Panginoon. Ito rin ang nakasulat sa Biblia sa Banal na Aklat na ang kaligtasan na isang handog o gift ay manatili ito sa buhay ng Kristiyano hanggang kamatayan. Hanggang lisanin na ang lupang ito at doon na siya sa kaharian ng Diyos. Ang salvation ay, ay eternal, hindi lamang sa haba ng panahon kung hindi, ito ay kalidad na binigay ng Diyos sa atin. Kalidad sa kaligtasan is eternal. Ngunit, may mga tao din na hindi naniniwala na ang kaligtasan ay hindi mawala. Sa akala nila na ang kaligtasan ay para lamang isang bagay na hiniram at conditional ito at mawawala. So, granting na ang kaligtasan ay mawawala. Kahit ang totoo hindi naman. At ito ang ating pag-uusapan ngayon. Itong pamagat na ito ay para lamang sa mga taong naniniwala totoong naniniwala na ang kaligtasan na mawawala ang pamagat ay 
how to lose your salvation there are 14 easy steps to lose your salvation so you want to lose your salvation well you don't really want to lose it but you think you have or could or that someone you know certainly has lost theirs they used to go to church every service and teach us in the school class but now they cast and drink and won't step inside a church door they were obviously saved before they are obviously lost now so they must have lost their salvation it is as simple as that or is it the idea of losing salvation is simple all you have to do is lose everything you gained when you got saved since you could never go to hell with anything you received when you were saved then everything you obtain through salvation must be either reversed or destroyed then you can go to hell so your next move is to find the source which can tell you how to reverse the steps well if you are going to lose your salvation just bear with me if you want to keep yours then you must lose it according to the rules the rule book is of course the word of god you must not rely on feeling or a common sense or human reasoning feelings can be wrong human thinking may not be god's way isaiah 55:8-9 only god's word is the absolute authority this brings us to the 14 easy steps for losing your salvation since every one of these steps represent some great blessing you receive when you get when you got saved then all of these steps must be completed without fail in order to lose your salvation you cannot miss any of them and become lost you must accomplish them all now it's time to tackle the first step one declare god's grace as insufficient the first step involves the basis of your salvation When you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you are saved totally by the grace of God. Ephesians 2:8-9 teaches, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, that of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is defined as God's unmerited favor. It is God doing for you what you cannot do for yourself. Since you cannot save yourself, God offers his gift of grace as the basis of your salvation. This means you cannot save yourself by good works, water baptism, church membership, church confirmation, loving your neighbor, and even the keeping of the Ten Commandments are all unable to give you or anyone else a place in heaven. Romans 3.20 states, Therefore by the death of the law therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin Titus 3:5 declares not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saves us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost now since good works can do nothing to earn salvation see galatians 2:16 philippians 2:9 then evil works can do nothing to remove salvation you are saved in spite of your sins you cannot become lost because of your sins since you are saved by grace you can only become lost by declaring god's grace as insufficient for you this is the first step second find the faith of Christ to be faulty whereas the first step remove the basis of salvation grace the second step is necessary to reverse the method of salvation faith contrary to popular belief you are saved by producing enough faith so that God will accept you oh yes you must believe but your belief is completed by the faith of Christ Again the Bible must be the authority. Look once more at Ephesians 2:8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You are saved by grace and through faith. But the faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, 
Does this mean that we are safe apart from our own decision to believe? Not at all. Read carefully Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You cannot be justified by the works of the law, but you can be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is not faith in Christ, but the faith of Jesus Christ. But in order to be justified by the faith of Christ, you must believe in Him. Sound confusing? Look at Romans 3.22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them, them that believe, for there is no difference. Notice the wording carefully. The righteousness of God is received on the basis of the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ is given unto all and upon all them that believe. See also Philippians 3.9 Although you must believe to the best of your ability, the perfect faith which provides for you a perfect salvation is the faith of Christ. This means that there is no need to pray through or hold on in order to get saved. We come to God in simple belief and He completes our faulty faith with the perfect faith of Christ. This also means that you cannot become lost by losing faith. Although your faith may waver at times, your salvation is based on the faith of Christ. Therefore, the only way to lose your salvation is to find the faith of Christ to be faulty. That completes the second step. Third step, get Christ to take back His righteousness. The third step has to do with the one of the great products of your salvation, imputed righteousness. This imputed righteousness, that means righteousness placed on us there from an outside source, involves the most uneven swap in the universe. When you get saved, you trade the rugs of your sin for the robes of Christ. Righteousness, let's consider this trade one part at a time. When Christ died on the cross, you took our sins upon himself, and he paid for them in full. Galatians 3.13 reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. 2 Corinthians 5.21 teaches, For he hath made him to be, his, to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God the Father made God the Son, Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin to be sin for us. That is, Christ took your sins upon himself when he died on the cross that you could take his righteousness upon yourself when you accept him as Savior. When you are saved, you are clothed in righteousness of Christ. See 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. When God the Father sees you, he sees you through the blood of his Son. Therefore, he will never have to stand before God in your own righteousness. Philippians 3.9 You are truly complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10 This also means that you cannot become lost by losing your own righteousness. Though your righteousness may fail from time to time, the righteousness of Christ can never fail. In order to lose your salvation, you must get Christ to take back his righteousness. And you must take the back, back upon yourself the sin for which he died. And so the third step is completed. Fourth, have the pardon removed from your sin. You receive something very special when you accept Christ. You receive a pardon for your sin greater than the pardon any criminal ever received from any governor or president. This pardon is based on none other than the sweet blood of Christ. Ephesians 1 7 declares, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. When you are quickened or made alive together with Christ, you are forgiven all trespasses, not just some or most, but all. This is why the forgiveness which saved is a completed act of the past and not a repeated act of the present. Ephesians 4.32 reads, 
and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ sake hath forgiven you. We are to be forgiving present time, others as God hath forgiven, past tense, us not as He forgives, present tense, us. God forgave all your sins at salvation, past, present, and future. Therefore, there is no need for a continual forgiving of sins in order to go to heaven. Note, of course, such complete forgiveness does not remove the need to repent from sins committed after salvation, but this daily cleansing of sins has no effect on salvation. Since you receive a full pardon at salvation, you cannot become lost by committing unpardoned sins. There can be no such thing for the saved person, although you may sin and deplace God after your salvation. God knew when He saved you what you would do and forgave you of those sins also. The only way out is to have the pardon which you received at salvation removed from your sin. And so ends step four. Fifth, convince the father to fail in his commitment. The fifth step has to do with the safekeeping of your soul. Before you are saved, you are the keeper of your own soul. And you cannot do anything but fail in its keeping. But when you get saved, you turn your soul over to the protection of another, God. 2 Timothy 1.12, Paul says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In salvation, you gave up control of your own soul and turned its safekeeping over to God the Father. God is now committed to the keeping of your soul to the end. 1 Corinthians 1.8 declares, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Also read Philippians 1.6, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Your confirmation unto the end, and the performance of of the work in you until, until the day of Jesus Christ is in the hand of the Lord. Therefore, you cannot become lost by failing in your commitment to Christ, since your salvation is based on the commitment of cry of God. The loss of personal commitment would not affect your eternal destiny. Not, no, the only way to lose your salvation is to somehow get God to fail in His commitment. This completes step 5. Six, break the father seal of the spirit. Step six has to do with one of the guarantee of your salvation. When you are saved, the Bible teaches that you are sealed by the spirit of God. Ephesians 1.13 teaches, In whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 2 Corinthians 1, 21-22 reads, Now he which established us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us in God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. These verses teach that you are sealed with the Holy Ghost by the Father at the time of salvation. The Holy Spirit is not your sealer, He is your seal. A seal is something that fastens securely and which must be broken in order to be opened. Your salvation is secured by the Spirit of God, and not only are you presently sealed, but you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 states, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The seal of the Spirit is guaranteed good unto the day of redemption. That is, the day when Christ takes up to be with Him. This means that you cannot become lost by breaking your promise to God, since your security is based on the seal of the Spirit. 
No promise or commitment broken by you can void your salvation. The only way to lose your salvation is to break the Father's seal of the Spirit. That is step six. Seven, change the meaning of everlasting. When you accept Christ as Savior, you receive the gift of eternal or everlasting life. Romans 6.23 explains, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.15.16, Father states that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God should love the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Please notice that Romans 6.23 and John 3.15 speak of eternal life, while John 3.16 speaks of everlasting life. When you are saved, you receive both. And while everlasting and eternal both means without end. There is a difference in emphasis. Everlasting is a term of quantity and emphasizes length of life. Everlasting as opposed to temporary. Eternal, on the other hand, is a term of quality and emphasizes the kind of, of life you receive at salvation. Eternal as opposed to temporal or earthly. As Christ taught, He came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10 verse 10. Probably the greatest thing about eternal life is that it is given as a present position. John 5.24 reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When you hear the word and believe in, on Christ, you have present tense, everlasting life. Nothing is ever said in scripture about receiving this life in the future. You, are, you, uh, you have everlasting life as a present position from the point of salvation. This means that you cannot lose everlasting life. Think about this. If your life has ending today, you are going to perish. Then it could not happen without ending or everlasting yesterday. To lose everlasting life would be an impossibility. Therefore, since to lose everlasting life would be a contradiction of terms, there is only one way to lose your salvation. You must change the meaning of the word everlasting. That is the completion of steps 7. 8. Unbirth yourself from the family of God. When you are saved, you are born again. This is the doctrine of regeneration. Titus 3.5 states, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Notice that you are saved by the washing of regeneration. The word regeneration means to, re to be reborn. You are said to be born again because your salvation is your second birth. Read the teaching of John chapter 1 verse 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. While your first birth was physical, your second birth is spiritual of God. By this new birth, you become one of the sons or children of God. Since you have been born into the family of God, you cannot become lost by denying your birth. A child but naturally born cannot cease to be the father child, no matter what is said or what separations are made. So an individual born into the family of God cannot simply cease to be the father child. In order to lose your salvation, you must somehow unbirth yourself from the family of God. That is step 8. 9. Nullify your adoption by the Father. Another benefit of salvation is your adoption by the Father. A saved person belongs to the Father by creation. He made us. By redemption, He brought us. By regeneration, we were born to Him. And by adoption, He adopted us. Concerning adoption, Galatians 4, 5-6 to teaches, To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
In salvation, you receive the adoption of Jesus. Therefore, through adoption, you also become one of the children of God. Romans chapter 8, 15 to 16. You cannot become lost by simply ignoring your adoption. Adoption is a legal and binding change of parents whereby you, you lose your, your old parentage of your fathers, the devil, John 8, 44, and gain a new father. You cannot lose your salvation by turning from your heavenly father. You must somehow nullify your adoption by the father. And so step 9 ends. 10. Separate yourself from the love of Christ. At the very moment, any person accepts Christ as Savior. Another wondrous blessing takes place. They are placed within the center of Christ's love. The love of Christ, which is beyond human comprehension, become your strong refuge. Read here, Ephesians 3.19. And to know the love of Christ, which passed the knowledge that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. To know Christ is to know a love which is unknowable. This is one of the miracles of salvation. This love into which you are placed is not only beyond human comprehension, but it is also the greatest power in the universe. Romans 8.35-39 states, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to, uh, present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, for, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that one by one, those things which might separate you from the love of Christ are eliminated. And then, lastly, all other possibilities are at once denied by the phrase, nor any other creature. To be in the love of Christ is to be eternally safe from all the dangers which your soul might encounter. In fact, you cannot become lost by denying Christ's love. When you give yourself to the love of Christ, He takes you into His bosom of love. This love is so powerful as to deny any other thing to, to come between His love and the Christian. Yet to lose your salvation, you must somewhere find the strength to separate yourself from this great love. That is step 10.